friends, today, the 50th day of Easter and the solemnity of Pentecost brings Easter time to a close. The Universal Church has been invited to renew its faith during these 50 days of Easter so that it might be prepared to accept the Lord's peace as an invitation to work with the Holy Spirit for the world's transformation. Personally, I think of no better way to close this Easter time than yesterday morning here in the Coe Cathedral. The Cardinal ordained three men to the priesthood for the Archdiocese of Galveston, Houston. And in the evening, two parishioners were called to confirmation. And this afternoon, the Cardinal will confirm 120 candidates in the sacrament of confirmation. All of these people have been and will be called to participate in the work of the Holy Spirit to transform the world in their own, each and own specific way. Each year at Pentecost, as Father mentioned earlier, we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church like we hear in the first reading. Today is the day the Spirit manifested himself to the apostles in the upper room and moved them to preach the gospel of Jesus to every corner of the earth. For a moment, let's imagine ourselves with the apostles in the upper room today. We've just spent three years of our lives living with Jesus, whom we believe to be the Messiah sent to save the world. We watched him get crucified and then experienced his resurrection. He's given us his final command, go and proclaim the gospel to all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Then he ascends into the sky, and he's gone. Now St. Luke describes a diverse group of disciples who are now so impassioned with their sudden empowerment for mission that people first thought they were drunk. The disciples themselves were awed by the fact that they could speak to Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, the precursor of today's Iranians. Mesopotamians, now Iraqis, Cappadocians, and people from Pontus, Pamphylia, and Phrygia, varieties of Turkish people. Asians and people from Libya and Cyrene from Africa, not to mention the Romans. Just as Cardinal Donardo continually reminds us that our archdiocese is a diverse international community, the apostles preached to the international crowd gathered in Jerusalem, and everybody understood what they were saying. That miracle would take them farther from their known world than they would have ever expected to travel. The obvious miracle was that they were able to speak about Jesus in a way that attracted people of different cultures and tongues into a shared faith. The greater miracle was that they were becoming a community of genuinely diverse people, men and women from any and every culture. They were beginning to become a Catholic, that is, a universal 
community. What does it mean that the first act of the Holy Spirit after being made manifest to the apostles is the gift of tongues? This should inform our own call to personal ministry. No matter what our gifts are, whether they are words, presence, or deeds, we should always remember that the primary work of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost is to get Christ's message out to everyone. In 1 Corinthians, St. Paul reminds us that such an empowered community is always a challenge for everyone concerned. It sounds so simple when he says it. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit. As St. Paul goes on about different forms of service, his point is that those who share in that diversity will become all they were created to be to the extent that each and every member strives to assure that everyone is called forth to contribute the best each has to offer for the good of all. That reminds me of the old army commercial. Be all you can be. We translate St. Paul's word for the gifts of the Spirit as charisms. This word shares its origin with the word charis, which we translate as grace, indicating that, like grace, charisms are exclusively gifts of God, unmerited and unobtainable by human effort. In the New Testament, the Greek word charisma appears only in the letters as if to explain that charisms become active after Pentecost, when the disciples were empowered to carry on Jesus' mis his mission in history. The Pentecost story proclaims that the gifts of the Spirit empower us to overcome the differences that divide the human community into competing or even warring factions. St. Paul's analogy of the body of Christ teaches that every person has the potential to be a source of grace for and to be graced by all others. In the Gospel of St. John, Pentecost, Christ's bestowal of gift of his spirit to the community happened on the day of the resurrection. Also, John depicts it. Jesus became present in the midst of the disciples and greeted them with shalom, peace. And after <clears throat> exposing them to the scars of his wounded hands and side, he again says, shalom. Then having made them aware of the cost of being agents of God's love, he says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. In a, react, a reenactment of the creation story that we find in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, Jesus breathed on them, saying, Receive the Holy Spirit. Once they received his Spirit, they were capable of carrying on his mission. Whereas in Genesis the human vocation was to be stewards of all creation. Jesus summarized his mission with a single command to forgive, hinting that forgiveness is the key charism of people who would be his disciples. The second half of Jesus' phrase, whose sins you retain, has been interpreted in multiple ways. It can be a warning that lack of forgiveness leaves the world in a state of chaos. 
Another possibility is that Jesus is reminding us that forgiveness cannot be imposed. As the story in John chapter 9, verse 20 through 41 demonstrates, when people refuse to see the truth, no one can free them from their sin. Forgiveness is characterized by brotherly dialogue with one another. It cannot be imposed. The Acts story says that 3,000 people were baptized on the day of Pentecost. We need to remember that those 3,000 included people known today as Iranians, Iraqis, Turks, Asians, Africans, and Europeans. The known world of the New Testament. If the enthusiasm of the disciples hadn't been enough to make people question their sobriety, their conviction that such diverse people could form a community of love and service should have made others question their sanity. This week's gospel reminds us of the gift we received in a special way through the sacrament of confirmation, one that we continue to receive any time we pray, come, Holy Spirit. The presence of God on earth exists in a concrete and specific way in the person of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes upon the apostles right after Jesus says, peace be with you. It is through the Holy Spirit that we do find peace a peace that is so sorely needed in our world today. Yet the Feast of Pentecost also challenges our hope and faith. Each week, we proclaim in the Creed, I believe in the Holy Spirit. Pentecost asks how deeply we mean that. Are we willing to let Christ's spirit impassion and empower us? Are we willing to be led beyond our culturally comfortable worlds to form communities that include such diversity and such different points of view that we will need and even learn to enjoy exercising the charisms of humility, humor, and forgiveness? Like forgiveness, which cannot be imposed, such communities spring from grace and are as costly as was Jesus' own mission. Pentecost promises that it is worth the cost. As we pray, come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and enkindle in them the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created, and you shall renew and transform the face of the earth. Praise be the sacred heart of Jesus, now and forever. Amen. Amen.